So now if you could go to the interpretation icon and select your language, and that will make sure that you're able to participate and that you have the, the clearest voice for tonight's meeting. Okay, so I hope everyone has selected their channel. And now I would like to turn it over to Lily Thomas from Marin County to open tonight's meeting. Thank you, Joan. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for being here. We're here tonight to talk about housing and where in our communities we can plan for more housing. This conversation is based in the context of updating our housing element. However, it is also about looking at our local needs and how we can make room for local workers, our children and seniors who want to age in place. We've heard from many of you these past few months through our survey, focus groups and community workshops um, around your housing concerns and needs. Um, when we talk about planning for more housing in our communities, this will mean change. And for those of us who live in Marin, that can be a difficult conversation. Um, the draft that we are talking about tonight is just that. It's a draft. There's no decisions have been made. And we are relying on you um, to give us feedback. Are these the right places for housing? Did we miss any? Or are there any reasons any of these sites should not be included? This is not the final list, and we have included more than we need to plan for to provide you and our decision makers with flexibility. We've also studied capacity for housing in all of our unincorporated communities. I'd now like to introduce the team um, who's helping the county plan to meet these challenging goals. So for the county staff, in addition to myself, I'm Lily Thomas, and I work for the Housing and Federal Grants Division. I'm joined by Jillian Zeiger and Aline Tanillion, um, who work with me also. Um, we have our consultant team with MIG. Um, in addition to Joan Chaplick that you heard earlier, we have Laura Stetson, Jose Rodriguez, Mirna Ortiz, and Ana Pelia. Um, you'll also see many other county and MIG staff members who will be acting as our facilitators when we go to the breakout rooms. And with that, I'll turn it back to Joan to go through our agenda. Okay, thank you, Lily. So for our meeting tonight, over the next site selection, the housing site, the housing plan is all about identifying where housing can be planned. And so we're going to introduce that process. Um, then um, we have breakout groups where we will be getting to, um, you'll have a chance to speak in groups. Um, and then following that, we're going to be introducing a tool called Balancing Act that is going to allow people to comment at the more site specific level. And we're going to show you how that's done. And then we'll have next steps and closing comments and we'll wrap up by 8 p.m. So our goals tonight, we want to make sure that we inform you about the planning process for achieving the county's housing element um, and making sure that you understand the site selection process. We want to make sure that we have provided an opportunity for you to share your input. You'll have a chance to comment verbally in the breakout groups and then also um, using polling and chat. Um, and then we're going to introduce this tool that's going to allow you to get more specific about the sites. So those are our main goals for tonight's meeting. Um, we have a lot of people registered for tonight's meeting and we have about 100 people online already. So please, as we're sharing our thoughts and opinions, please be respectful of each other. We, we expect there to be multiple viewpoints. We're not making any decisions tonight. We don't have to reach consensus. Um, please speak from your own perspective, so check your assumptions. Um, provide input when directed. So we're going to stop periodically and ask questions, so that's the best time to, to let us know you have a question. When we're in the breakout groups, one person speaking at a time. Um, and then just please be patient. Technology happens. We have practiced and we have backup plans, but, you know, um, there's always some surprises. Um, and then also, if you want to keep your video on, it, it helps make this just a little bit more human so we can see who we're connecting with during tonight's meeting. 
In terms of the Zoom, the basic Zoom controls that we'll be using, um, we went through the interpretation feature where you select your channel. Um, and then we also have the chat feature. Um, and then when you're in the breakout rooms, you'll be able to raise your hand and be called upon. And I just want to remind our Spanish speaking participants that if you put anything in the chat, we do have colleagues available who can translate it so that your information is responded to and is part of the meeting. Okay, so here's how you'll be able to participate in tonight's meeting. We're gonna start with some polling questions, so we hope that you'll respond. There'll be various points where we ask you if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. You'll be able to talk, um, talk and share your comments verbally when we're in the small group discussions. And then after tonight, we'll be introducing an online tool that you can use to provide more feedback into the process. So hopefully that will give you several opportunities. So let's start um, by testing the chat. So what I'd like to uh, see from you all is just in one word, if you could describe the current housing situation in Marin County. Um, so I'm gonna read some of them off and I'm gonna ask um, my colleague Myrna if any come in in Spanish to read them as well. So I see expensive, crisis, overpriced, complicated, tight, expensive and very full, building, tight, inadequate, fluffy, limited, privileged, expensive, critical, difficult, racist, unsustainable, expensive, ridiculous, old, inadequate, inequitable, unfair, uh, difficult, Okay, congested. So let's just wrap up with a few more inaccessible, community killing, expensive, congested. Okay, well, thank you all for your thoughts. And I think, you know, your, your comments help us understand um, the, the problem that we're trying to address through this housing element. So with that, now we're going to move to some polling questions. And we've asked these same questions at every workshop and they help us understand who we have been able to reach. So my colleague, Anna, is going to be supporting me with the polling questions. Um, she's gonna activate the first question and we'll, we'll be wanting to know where, where do you live? So as soon as that first question comes up, you'll be able to respond. Okay, let's see. So, Joan, uh, someone else is logged on with my account. So, okay, so I just, how's it? Uh, Mirna, Sorry. can you launch it? So, Anna, are you seeing the polling? The polling question is live. So, um, I'm able to, to uh, manage the polls. So, um, again, technology happens, but uh, here we are. So um, in terms of where you live, um, we want to find out how many people live in unincorporated Marin County. Um, this housing element will focus on unincorporated, house, unincorporated county, but we know um, countywide this is an issue of significance. Okay, let's, I'm going to end the polling here. Um, and let's see, so I can share the results. And um, you should be able to see that uh, we have 62% of the participants tonight are from unincorporated Marin County, 35% from uh, the cities within the county, and we have two respondents who don't live in Marin County. Okay, let's go to the next polling question. Okay. So now you should be able to see the next polling question. So if you tell us that you live in unincorporated Marin County, uh, where are you? Uh, West Marin, unincorporated. Um, and again, for those it doesn't apply to, we have the last choice available. Okay, let's just take uh, a few more seconds and, and get as many responses as we can. This information is very helpful. 
Okay, I'm going to end the polling here and share the results. Okay, so 15% in West Marin, 10% um, unincorporated San Rafael, 14% unincorporated Novato, 36% in Southern Marin. Okay, so let's go to that next polling question. Okay. Okay, so now we're on our third question. Do you work in Marin County? So yes, no, or maybe you're retired, unemployed, or other circumstances. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. That's a pretty quick question there. And you can see, so more than half of you work in Marin County. 18% no and 28% do not work. Okay, let's go to the next polling question. Okay, so how long have you lived in Marin County? Are you a newcomer, less than one year, or are you someone who has been here uh, 10 years or more? Okay, the responses are slowing down a little bit, so how about if I end the polling question? There we go. Um, so we have 83% have been here more than 10 years. So um, some newcomers. So, um, okay, um, glad to see that. So now let's go to our next question. Oops. Uh, so tell us about your housing situation. Do you own your home, rent your home, live with family and friends, or you don't currently have permanent housing? So we're, we're always curious about how many homeowners or renters that were able to attract to these meetings. Okay, so let's, uh, let's end the poll and share the results. And okay, so 82% own, own their own home and we have 11% renters, okay? And let's now go to our final polling question. Um, so please tell us your age. The polling's confidential. Um, uh, the county team has done a lot of work using a lot of different methods to see, to make sure that we have good age diversity in our participation. And so just wanna see how, who we've been able to bring to our meeting today. And so how about if we close our poll? And uh, so, okay, well, we have almost half are over 65. Um, so, and we have a few folks that are in the 18 to 29 age range. So we have some, some good age distribution in tonight's meeting. So, okay, thank you for your participation with this polling question. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up the polling. And now we're gonna go to our presentation related to the housing element overview. And, uh, Laura Stetson from MIG, one of our senior planners and housing specialists, is going to walk us through the housing element overview. Laura? Thank you, Joan, and thank you to everybody who's spending time with us this evening to talk about a very critical issue uh, throughout the state, and, and certainly in Marin, it was Marin County, it was very enlightening to see the comments you all made regarding the housing situation in, in the county. Next slide. Some of you may have been to some prior meetings we have had, either in focus groups or workshops, and so a little of this may be repeat information to you, but for those of you who are new, uh, I will make sure to be thorough in describing what a housing element is. This is a document that's part of the county's countywide plan. The county, uh, just like every jurisdiction in California, is required to do a long-range plan for growth and development, preservation of resources, everything that makes a place special. The housing element is one chapter and it's a little bit different than the rest of the comprehensive plan because it is required to be updated every eight years. And so every community in California, city, county is required on a rolling basis to update their housing plan. This is a document that is reviewed by the state to, for compliance with some very um, uh, difficult state law, just to, it's very dense if you will. 
And for this, the Northern California Bay Area region, something called the uh, Association of Bay, Bay Area Government Region or ABAG, the deadline to complete the housing element and have it certified by the state is December of this year. The document that we're talking about this evening covers only those properties in unincorporated Marin. So if you live in the city of Novato or San Rafael or Mill Valley, your city is preparing its own housing element. And that will be separate from something that the, the county is doing. The housing plan is the center point of the housing element. And that's what we're focusing on tonight. Where are the sites where housing could be constructed um, and planned for over the next eight years to support the housing needs of the, the county? In order to reach that, uh, to go through that analysis, we need to look at what are the needs from a demographic standpoint in the county. What are the programs that the, city, that the county has pursued in the past and assess whether or not it, uh, there are good programs to move forward with, those which may not be working, um, and um, those that uh, might need to be new. The, what are the constraints to housing development? Be, be they uh, government constraints due to zoning codes or processes and uh, other constraints. Uh, the, the supply chain is making um, housing construction difficult these days. What are the resources that are available? Not just land resources, but financial resources to provide housing. And then lastly, there is a requirement that has been in housing elements for a number of years, but now has been elevated by the state to require a much more rigorous analysis of what have been past practices of segregation or ways that people have been shut out of the housing market um, or discriminated against, and how can this housing element reverse those past Friends. Next slide. This process to update the housing element began in um, the, the late spring of last year. There, was, there were a series of workshops and meetings and surveys. And parallel with that, the technical team has been analyzing, um, as we mentioned, things like the, the resources and the constraints and the needs in the community. So there's a technical side as well as a side of talking to the community to, to find out what those housing challenges are. And throughout this, uh, the winter of this year, and uh, we will continue to analyze those potential sites in order to pre pre prepare this list of candidate sites, which will be subject to environmental analysis. In the spring and summer of this year, we will be preparing graphs, not just to the housing element, but there is a parallel process to update the county's safety element as well, and also to do some zoning code amendments that might be necessary to implement housing policy. During the summer, we'll make sure that we're going through the proper review periods, both at the state and um, more importantly, with the public, the people who make up the, the unincorporated areas. And then moving into Board of Supervisor and Planning Commission, or Planning Commission, then board hearings in the, in the winter of 2022. Um, the county is looking to be finished by the end of this year, um, although I, I would note that the housing element is actually uh, due to the state by the end of January, but uh, it's always nice to turn in your homework early. It gives you a little bit of a cushion. So that's what the, the county is aiming for. Next slide. I'm going to talk about the cornerstone of every housing element in the state, and it's something called the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, and that's the RENA. Next slide. The state has a statewide process to assess what the housing demands are throughout California, and not just current demand, but what has pent up demand been because housing construction has not been able to keep pace with demand. And so the state determines what that need is statewide and makes assignments throughout various regions as to how many housing units need to be planned for. And as I mentioned for the Bay Area, the ABAG region, that number is roughly 441,000 new homes to be provided for during the, the planning period of 2023 to 2031. Uh, and the process trickles down to each county. And so all of Marin County, the unincorporated areas and all of the cities within Marin have an obligation to plan for roughly 14,000 units. And of those, 3,569 need to be located within unincorporated communities in Marin. 
as the little blue box on the on the slide shows you, Marin County as a whole accounts for 3.2 percent of this allocation throughout the Bay Area. But the within the un, uh, within the county itself, the unincorporated areas account for 25 percent, which means 75 percent of the housing needs to be planned for within cities. Next slide. The process of preparing housing elements goes back many, many years. And as I mentioned, it, there's, there are blocks of time that, that, that you prepare them for. And as this chart shows, uh, the, the, the numbers for Marin County over the last three cycles of housing elements have been relatively low. In fact, during the, the prior period from 2015 to 22, 22, the county was assigned a fairly low allocation of 125. That number, has now jumped to 3,569. And every community, every city, every county throughout California has seen a similar um, substantial increase in the housing allocation. This housing allocation is not just total number of new homes, but it's homes divided up among different income categories. And so the chart shows you that homes need to be planned to be affordable at different income ranges from people and, and households with very low incomes up to market rate housing or what's termed above moderate housing. And you can see there uh, that it, it is distributed um, towards both the high and the low end and in the middle, the low income and moderate income um, are also you know, pretty good uh, numbers to, to try to address, but not as much as the, the very low income and the market rate. Next slide. A summary of the housing needs in the community, and I think some of it was um, expressed through the, the comments that you made at, at Joan's opening question, is it, it's a challenge. I think it, it all can be rolled up into, and it's a challenge. And that's reflected in some of the data that uh, there is an increase in renter household size, meaning people are, are more people are living in homes in order to share housing costs. There has been very limited growth in the county over a number of years. The primary, form of housing continues to be detached single family homes throughout the county. There are a large number of singles who live by themselves. Believe it or not, 27% of all households in the county are single person households. Um, there might be some capacity there if, they, if people like to share homes. Uh, I think we, we might notice too from the polling questions, uh, at least from the people who are attending this evening, that there are a high number of seniors in unincorporated county areas. 22% uh, of all homes are occupied by seniors, either uh, seniors living alone or senior couples. Next slide. There are escalating housing costs. Um, not, not only has there not been a uh, low production, I think any of us who had Economics 101 in uh, high school or, or college remembers that uh, if there's the supply and demand, if the, the supply is down, the, the costs go up. And so that, that's obviously um, revealed in, in the data. There has been a, an increased amount of segregation in um, Marin County since 1990. And the, the, the communities of Marin City and Santa uh, Venetia um, have been coming increasingly of, of lower income and non-white. And this is, is a trend that, that has continued as housing has become more expensive. Next slide. So that's setting the stage for figuring out where can we plan for housing? Where can the county look to accommodate these housing? And my, my colleague, Jose Rodriguez, is going to go into some of the detail of what um, is going to influence this site selection process. And, and we're looking very much forward to hearing from everybody this evening. But there are a couple of things that we do have to keep in mind when, when planning to uh, sites for housing. And these are things that are in housing element law. Number one, um, if a property isn't vacant, it might be used for, for additional housing, but we need to look at what the use is on that site. Is there some realistic potential that that site might redevelop, that a property owner might be interested in tearing down, say, one single family home and building um, apartments or townhomes or condominiums if the zoning allows that to occur? We need to look at site size, and this is especially important for affordable housing. There's a, essentially a, a, a Goldilocks type site, um, meaning it's not too big, it's not too small, it can accommodate units 
that, that uh, can be built at an affordable level. And so we need to look at that. And that's to a large degree develop, um, influenced by the, the intensity of use that is allowed. What does the zoning allow in terms of how many homes per acre of land can, can be placed on a particular site? Next slide. There is a general proxy for affordability. It doesn't necessarily always hold true, but um, typically the higher the density is on a site, the more affordable housing can be just because you, you get economies of scale um, in that equation. And so this chart shows you that um, different types of homes could be affordable uh, based on, on, on their density. Next slide. This is the big topic that we want to consider this evening is what are the things that a community you all need to think about and your decision makers need to think about when planning for housing and finding sites to put housing. Back in December, uh, your, your county staff made a presentation to the, the Board of Supervisors and, and asked for some guiding principles to help shape the analysis and, and the decisions on selecting housing sites. And the board affirmed four guiding principles, four key guiding principles, to ensure that there is a countywide distribution of units, that the units aren't just placed in one of the um, supervisorial districts or just near um, existing uh, communities, what, uh, that there needs to be this distribution. That there needs to be a clear focus on um, reversing trends of concentrating lower income housing in, in uh, particular communities within Marin County. To look at uh, ways to encourage infill development, meaning uh, development that is not out in the hinterlands, that uh, is in areas where you have water service, sewer service, um, other, other services that are important for, for neighborhoods. But balance that too with the fact that uh, Marin County, for all of its beauty is there for a reason. There are many things that, that uh, affect why you have the terrain that you do, or um, there are other environmental hazards associated with a warming uh, climate, uh, sea level rise, high fire hazards. And so these are things that need to be considered and, and as the uh, site selection process. So those were the four key guiding principles that the board affirmed. But the, they also said use uh, um, the, the two key lenses of leveraging surplus land, meaning is, are there government owned lands that can really provide opportunities for um, housing? And then critically ensure that there is robust public engagement at all stages of this site selection process and the housing element as a whole. And that's why we're, we're here this evening because that's something very important to continue to, to hear from from everybody in the community. Next slide. Before I turn this over to Jose, um, I want to just say that there are uh, a lot of complicated factors that go into this equation. And so we will go through those and have the opportunity to explain them in greater detail if you have questions when we go into the breakout groups, because I see a lot of chat questions coming in and uh, I look forward to, for people bringing those questions and those comments into the chat rooms. Jose? Well, thanks, Laura. What I want to talk about tonight is really the process and the different strategies the county and we are using to select sites. These are some of the key strategies that we are using, again, to select sites. The first one is obviously looking at vacant land, vacant land in residential areas. We know that there are vacant land throughout the county. We do recognize that many of these vacant lands also have constraints to them, slope constraints, or they're in wildfire areas. So we are taking those factors into consideration. Another approach, and again, as we identify sites and a number of units for these sites, we do use them against the arena. We're trying to get to that 3,600 number of units. So another way to get there is looking at a pr uh, approved and proposed projects. Those are projects that applicants have, or property owners or applicants have submitted uh, applications and maybe have approvals and they haven't started construction yet. We can start counting those uh, against the RENA. Another method to count against the RENA and a strategy we're using is accessory dwelling units. And I believe many of you have heard 
about this uh, type of housing, particularly with new state laws that have taken place. But basically this is where you can build a smaller unit in your, uh, on your property, uh, maybe above your garage. And so it again, it increases the supply of housing. Publicly owned land, as Laura mentioned, we are looking at county land as well as state land to see if there's any surplus areas uh, where they may be appropriate to build housing on. And we're looking at sites again throughout the county. There's a potential to increase density in some residential areas, and we call this upzoning or increasing the densities where we can allow more units to be built within certain areas and we increase the density and you can build either more duplexes or some multifamily uh, to again, increase uh, the number of housing units. Another strategy is looking at commercial sites, uh, potentially allowing for mixed use, allowing the commercial to stay and maybe building and providing housing within parking areas or redeveloping uh, older buildings for mixed use, allowing some commercial and residential uh, within certain sites. Another strategy is religious institutions. There are new state laws that give religious institutions a little bit of flexibility in providing housing on their sites. We're not uh, pushing uh, churches out, but looking at parking areas, uh, surplus lands that they may have for housing sites. And new state laws uh, allow churches to build housing in their parking lots and they, don't have, and they only have to replace 50% of the parking. So it gives them a little bit of flexibility to provide for housing on their properties. So we're gonna take advantage and look at the larger parking areas and see where their housing opportunities might take place on some of those sites. School sites as well. Again, we're only looking at surplus areas, excess site areas where maybe a school has closed or there's a different use that has, has gone on, on uh, at the school site. Let's, uh, we're gonna take a look at those sites. We have taken a look at a lot of those sites and to see where there's housing options uh, there as well. And then one of the last strategies we're looking at is conversion of existing uh, structures. This could be a motel or an existing uh, a commercial building with office uses on top. Uh, maybe the offices can be converted to housing or a motel uh, could be converted to uh, housing. And I know this has been done previously uh, in Marin as well. So this is the conversion, conversion of existing buildings. So these are the key strategies we're looking at as, as a lens in selecting ho uh, housing sites. Next slide, please. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into a little bit of the detail of the process of selecting the housing sites. Our analysis has looked at many, many areas throughout the county. Uh, we looked at uh, many, many properties, but we also applied the various constraints that we know uh, that are occurring in the county. The wildfire hazards, sea level rise, uh, slope conditions, all those are taken into account when we're looking at the site selection. Next slide, please. Let me talk a little bit about that process because when we find a site, uh, we do start to look at the characteristics of the property to see what capacity, how many units can that site properly hold? Uh, for example, many of the vacant lands that I mentioned earlier, there are gonna be many of them that have slope conditions. We are not uh, saying or jamming many, many housing in, in vacant lands that have slopes because we, we do recognize that those constraints limit how many housing you can build on those slope conditions. So some of the assumptions that we're looking at to making sure that we use a realistic capacity on how many units can be applied to this, the housing sites that we've identified, the size of the property, is it vacant, existing uses, um, if there's constraints, we wanna make sure we adjust the assumptions so that we're, again, calculating a, an accurate capacity of how many housing units can be on a site. For the under residential, uh, underutilized sites where there's existing housing, we want to, we're looking at specific lot sizes that we know can maybe accommodate few, uh, more houses. If there's one, maybe there's a zone that allows multifamily, but there's only one existing housing now. Is there an opportunity to rebuild additional housing uh, on that site? And then building the land value ratio, uh, just briefly, this is really looking at when investments were made to properties 
both for commercial and residential, has the property owner made investments within the past few years? We're not going to use those sites. We're looking for sites that where investments have not been made over the past 30 or 40 years. Housing is a little bit older. The commercial property is a little bit older. These properties may be more ripe for redevelopment. Uh, we don't want to take to the state sites that have brand new development on there because the likelihood of housing happening on those properties within the cycle of this housing element probably won't occur. And then the last thing, the underutilized non-residential is just commercial offices. Again, we looked at uh, various sites. Laura mentioned the sweet spot. We're looking at sites uh, for these particular properties that are a little bit larger. Um, and we incorporate, if it's mixed use, can we let how much commercial can still be realistic on that property, particularly if we're looking at a larger shopping center. We still want to, some sites may might, might make sense to maintain a lot of that commercial, or maybe there's parking areas where we can apply some housing as well. And, I, and as I mentioned earlier, the religious institutions, we're not counting all of those church sites. We're looking at the parking lots and only counting 50% in the event that they build a, por a portion of that property for housing uh, and they don't have to replace it with parking and, and purchase additional land for parking for Sunday services. So those are all the things, kind of the more detailed uh, capacity assumptions we're taking into account. Next slide. The first thing uh, our analysis did was we looked at the existing zoning and countywide land use plan. Uh, as I mentioned, we could count ADUs, so we use that to see how much we can use that against the arena, the 36, uh, uh, 3,569 units that the state is, is asking the county to plan for. We look at the credit sites, and then we looked at the existing zoning, uh, the vacant lands, and where, op where there's opportunities for housing. And what we found is we're still short meeting the arena, particularly between the lower and moderate income area. So you can see the lower, we're short 15, uh, 11, almost 11, 1,200 units. And even in the moderate, uh, we're still short about 200. The above moderate, uh, and as Laura mentioned in that little chart, that's where a lot of the single family homes uh, are counted in the above moderate. We actually can meet that now, uh, but overall we're short. Uh, meeting the arena. So what does that mean? We're going to look at sites where we have to do some rezoning. Uh, and that's why we brought in those strategies to look at those church sites, to look at commercial sites, and where we can change some of the zoning to allow that higher density for the lower and the moderate income categories. Next slide. So the strategy that the uh, Marin County is taking in addressing the regional housing needs assessment, the RENA, is we're taking first a broad stroke approach. We are finding locations for more housing that the RENA can, that we need for the RENA. Uh, and we're, again, looking at those guiding principles to help us. But the, the, our first goal is to find where we can find sites throughout the county. We're gonna need, the, we want the community help part of this public workshop, we want input on a lot of these housing sites because we want to narrow it down. We first want flexibility. We want to see where we can build houses, where we can get the units, but then now we're going to use, we want to use the community to help us whittle that number down. We're not going to take all of these housing units and move them into the housing element and count them against the arena. Uh, we have more housing units that we need. Our goal is to whittle that down. So how do we do that? Let's go to the next slide, please. We're gonna use the guiding principles that Laura mentioned, and we're turning them into what we're calling scenarios. Again, these are the four guiding principles, the ensure countywide distribution, uh, addressing racial equity and historic patterns of segregation, the infill and environmental hazards. So we have our large list of housing sites. What, what we're doing, and as we whittle down, and when we hear from the community, we want to hear about these different scenarios. Which ones do you like? Which don't you like? What's important to you? Maybe there's more than one that you like. And what we're, do, what we're going to do is start to whittle those numbers down based on what's important to the community. If, the, if it's being uh, having countywide distribution, that means maybe there might be too many housing uh, units in one area, so we can take some of those housing units out. If it's important for infill housing, maybe we take some of the housing out in the uh, uh, 
inland uh, or the rural areas and maybe concentrate in the infill areas or addressing and considering environmental hazards, the sea level rise. If we have housing sites and we do now have selected some heights, some housing sites that are near or uh, adjacent to the, ba the bay, um, should we take those sites out? Uh, so this is the process that we're going to be doing with the community over the next month, uh, a little bit of January and a lot of February, to really hear from the community what's important. And there's a tool that we'll uh, that I'll be sharing soon. Uh, it'll actually be up uh, tomorrow, um, but you'll be able to look at the different sites and be able to adjust units. Uh, and in the each of the sites, I, I take that back. You, the there will be four. Uh, scenarios that you get to choose and you get to comment on the scenarios and the numbers will change based off those scenarios so you get to adjust the numbers and provide your input you can provide your input by the number of units you can provide your input uh, through through commenting and and qualitative comments so with that I'm going to turn the uh, presentation back over to Joan okay so we have time for questions I'm going to ask Jillian Zeiger and um, her colleagues at the county to assist with these, and uh, the MIG folks may answer some of the questions as well. Um, so uh, uh, one, one brief question is um, workforce housing, housing for teachers. Which income category is that within the Rena chart? That is a great question. Um, so without knowing offhand all of the teacher salaries and all the different districts in the county, um, we would probably say that they fit into the low income category. Um, I do wanna note that the way that the housing element works, um, we are providing a plan, you know, an eight year plan on these sites for the different um, income levels. We don't specify if it's workforce housing or, um, you know, we, we don't specify the type of housing. Um, if a developer chooses the site, they're able to specify that. Okay, thanks, Jillian. Um, there were a couple of comments that came in that dealt with um, traffic and congestion. Um, and so, Jose, if you or maybe another team member could speak to how is that factored into the process? And then also the same thing, there were some fires, uh, some concerns related to fire danger and, um, you know, being able to evacuate. So how does this site selection process address those, those realities that are, are part of life in Marin County? I'll, I'll answer the traffic question first. Uh, as we select the sites, we are going to, uh, there will be a preparation of an environmental impact report that conducts an environmental analysis that includes traffic analysis. So the sites will uh, go through a thorough analysis uh, for traffic. Prior to that though, uh, many of these sites will actually do a detailed traffic uh, study uh, on sites that the county has identified that this might be a traffic issue. So we do have uh, a, a consultant, traffic consultant team that will study traffic specifically. And then the second, Joan, the second question was on wildfire. Uh, well, people were concerned about, you know, evacuation during fire. Um, how do we, uh, you know, the person talked about, um, you know, trying to evacuate during the East Bay fire in 91. And so how does this process respond to those kind of emergency conditions that can happen? Jillian, I'm going to turn it back to you. Do you want me to answer that question or do you want someone else to answer that? Yeah, if you want to, um, if you want to start and then I'm happy to fill in. Okay, great. So for the wildfire, one of the four scenarios that we're looking at does consider the environmental, ha how do we consider environmental hazards? So if you feel that wildfire is important, uh, look at that scenario and you can adjust sites that maybe are in the wildfire zones. Um, the environmental impact report will definitely, there is a wildfire section that addresses wildfire uh, issues uh, and the mitigation associated with that in terms of evacuation routes. Um, there is also a safety element that Laura mentioned that is being developed and updated concurrently wildfire is going to be a major section in that safety element. And so there will be analysis 
of access and evacuation routes. Uh, it does have to be approved by the board, uh, the fire board, uh, the state uh, board of for, uh, fire and forestry. Uh, so they're gonna be looking at the evacuation routes and that there's policies and programs in place that address those things, uh, the wildfire zones, the, uh, the interface zones between uh, e existing development, new development, and high wildfire, uh, high, high vegetation areas and wild and within wildfire zones, and then the evacuation routes. So all of those will all be definitely reviewed and incorporated in the EIR, in the safety elements, and through the review of our scenarios. If we hear from the public that the environmental hazards is really, really important, we're going to take a, a closer look at all those sites that are within the wildfire areas and other hazards, flooding hazards, and uh, sea level ride ha uh, hazards. But we do know, this will be my last point, is that there is mitigation that could allow some of those developments to happen in those areas. Uh, and so we're gonna take, we're gonna look at all of those factors and considerations. Okay, thanks, Jose. Jillian, were you gonna add anything? No, nothing to add, he hit all the points that I was considering. Okay, so there's a question, who's going to pay for the infrastructure improvements that are needed at these sites? And, and they're concerned that the taxpayers will end up paying with it instead of the nonprofit developers. Okay. Um, I am going to turn this question over to my colleague, Lily Thomas. Or, I'm sorry. Um, Lily, could you start and then maybe Laura could fill in? Sure. So... You know, when, when you're evaluating any type of development, looking at the infrastructure is part of the development process when you're considering any new development. So if a development was going to result in traffic, then that would have to be mitigated as part of the development. So those considerations would have to be taken into con when, when a project is approved, we look at the development impacts. That's part of the, the typical development process. Um, if it is an affordable housing developer, um, they also would, those would have to be part of their development costs when they were applying for funds, et cetera, and getting financing for the project. Um, that said, sometimes um, impact fees for affordable housing developers, as somebody mentioned in the chat, are waived, and that and those are that would then be absorbed. That some of those impact fees would be absorbed by the county. So it would also depend on on what type of development um, it was, whether it was um, a market rate or an affordable housing development. I don't know, Laura, if you wanted to add anything to that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lily. Um, so uh, here's a question. What is the definition of success in meeting the goal of the uh, required units? And what are the consequences of not meeting the RENA goal? Um, uh, okay. Um, the, I, I will start by answering that the definition of success for us is to have an approved housing element, an approved safety element. Um, in terms of not having an approved housing and safety element, I can speak to some of the penalties and I think that some of our colleagues can fill in. Um, if, if we don't complete our housing element, uh, we are in jeopardy of losing funding. That includes transportation funding, funding around um, climate change projects. Um, and there's also a newly developed office um, at the state level um, that it is really meant to kind of work with jurisdictions who are not, who don't have a compliant housing element um, and to enforce some uh, penalties and fines. Um, I, I'll let Lily speak to some of the other uh, penalties. Yeah, so, so it, I, I think Jillian hit on them that you're, you know, not eligible for, for funding, including affordable housing funding, but also many transportation dollars that are available to address some of the concerns that people wrote, brought up around traffic and infrastructure. And so by not having a certified housing element, we may not be eligible for many of those funds. And then we're subject to litigation. And if there's litigation, most of the 
most, if not all, of the litigation that is that has happened, the the jurisdiction loses and ends up having to pay for legal fees and then adopt a housing element on a on an accelerated timeline. Um, and in addition to that, um, if we're not meeting uh, some of our housing goals, then we can be subject to additional streamlining, which means that the local jurisdiction loses, um, you know, local control over approving projects. And that then just happens on a streamlined um, basis. And so that's another um, likelihood if, if the county does not have a certified housing out. Okay. Thank you, Lily. Um, there was a comment related to AB 672, which is proposed legislation to um, build homes on public uh, golf courses. Any any thoughts on that? Any comments? I'm actually not familiar with that legislation. Um, it's something that we'll be tracking, but uh, it's not something that I'm familiar with at this point. But we will be evaluating. You know, we'll we're evaluating all possible properties. So if there's you know, any kind of vacant property is or underutilized property are being evaluated. And I, I would just add that once the site list comes out, if there is a site that you think would be great for our housing element, um, you can suggest it to us. And one of my colleagues will put a link in the chat box uh, so that so that you can do so. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you. So um, we've gotten a number of comments um, and I hope we've answered as, as many questions as we can or at least touched on your question or comment in some way. Um, we do want to move into our breakout group discussions. So this is an opportunity where you'll be in small groups and you'll be able to talk about the site selection process. Um, you know, you may have you may have some questions. We'll we'll answer what we can, um, but we but our focus really is to hear your thoughts and opinions. Um, there's also an FAQ guide that was just dropped in the chat, and I just want to remind everyone the county's website for the housing and safety element, and it's the address is on the footer of every slide. MarinCounty.org/housing-safety-elements is a a deep treasure trove of information related to the housing and safety elements. So um, I recommend that you check that out after the meeting. Um, so you're going to be going into breakout groups. Each group has a facilitator and note taker, so they're all going to be run the same. When you're in there, we really appreciate if you could be respectful of others and differing viewpoints. We're not working to achieve consensus or make decisions. We just want to hear your opinions and we expect people to have different opinions. Um, when you'd like to speak, please use the raise hands feature. Um, and we're going to ask you to share your comments on the site selection process and to kind of help the frame the conversation. Um, we'd like to know based on the scenarios that Jose talked through, the four scenarios, um, was there a scenario that you prefer? Um, we had, you know, focusing on countywide distribution, um, an equity scenario, a scenario that encouraged infill, and one that focused on environmental hazards. Is there one that you prefer? Is there a combination? Or do you have general comments on the site selection process? Um, so we're going to be in breakout groups uh, for about 30 minutes. And then we do want you to come back because this is the more general conversation. And then when you return back, Jose is going to talk more about the specifics of the sites and how you can make comments and weigh in on the specific sites and kind of configuration and give your input into how the housing element gets created. So with that, I'm gonna ask my colleague to send us all into breakout rooms. You will um, get a note to join a breakout Before group. Before we do that. Um, oh, yes. Please go ahead, Anna. Before we do that, uh, si alguien ocupa hablar español, um, por favor, levanta la mano. Okay. So we just asked those in the who would like to be in a Spanish language breakout
Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining this breakout session and this meeting. We'll wait for all the participants. Um, and then I'm going to give a brief spiel, um, just kind of explaining what we're doing here, what our purpose is. Um, I'm joined by Julia Elkin, uh, who is a planner in our sea level rise division, and she will be taking notes. Okay. Okay, this looks like the group. I, I don't see any changes. So um, my name is Jillian Zeiger, and I am in the Housing and Federal Grants Division. I'm currently working on the housing element. So uh, we'll be working together for about 30 minutes to provide you all a chance to share your comments and ideas related to the candidate housing sites. So during this time, we'll want to stay focused at a more general level, talking about the scenarios. Um, we're not intending to go to specific sites or addresses. Uh, we're going to talk about that in the next section of the meeting. So my role is to really help us manage our time so that you all get to share some comments with the group. And I'm assisted by Julia, and she's going to take notes. And each group is using the same discussion and note-taking format. And all of your comments will be shared with the project team. Um, they'll also be shared, you know, the comments are also all being consolidated for the Board of Supervisors um, and the public. So we're also limited in our ability to answer detailed questions. Um, my, our purpose is really to listen to each other, to collect input. Um, I expect there's gonna be various opinions. There is no expectation of consensus here, but I just encourage you to stay on topic and be respectful of each other's viewpoints. So let's stay on mute while others are speaking. Um, periodically, I may do a round robin and call on people to make sure that everyone's had a chance to comment. If you could use the raise hand feature when you have a comment and I'll call on you to speak. And if you're not ready or if you don't have a comment, you can say pass and I'll come back to you later. Um, when it is your turn, you can introduce yourself to the group and provide any comments you have. Um, so we, we have a good sized group, um, not too big. Um, so we can be you know focused on, on our comments, but I, I encourage no crosstalk or back and forth. Um, so really tonight, we want to hear from you about the site selection process, the team. So our, our consultant team, MIG and county staff have identified a broad number of sites across the county, and then we'll narrow them down to meet the uh, RENA number, which uh, is 3,569. So the process is informed by three main inputs. So the list of sites is gonna be narrowed by applying the guiding principles, technical analysis of the properties, and that technical analysis includes parcel size, hazard, zoning, environmental features, et cetera. Um, and then finally, and most importantly, is community feedback. So there were four scenarios prepared um, and each one is based on the guiding principles. Um, just a reminder, those four scenarios, and I don't know if I can put them in the chat. Um, maybe if, if we forget them at some point, Julia, if you want to maybe share your screen so we can see them, but let's start without that. So the first is to ensure countywide distribution. And I'm happy to answer questions about these and go into detail um, during the discussion. So ensure countywide distribution, address racial equity and historic patterns of segregation, encourage infill and redevelopment opportunities. And the last one is consider environmental hazards. So just a reminder that leveraging surplus lands and ensuring robust public engagement around all sites, it, it, you know, it applies to all of the scenarios. So I guess my first question is, what are your thoughts on the scenarios? Is there one you prefer? Um, and you, you can tell us why you might prefer that one. Does anyone want to start? Um, would it would it be helpful for us to have a a little screen with all of the the scenarios on them? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's start with Susan and Christopher. I can't hear you very well. Mm -hmm. 
I can't hear you very well. Do you want to, um, you can type your comments into the chat. The chat, the chat is shared by all of the breakout rooms, but I'm happy to read them to the group. I hope I'm not speaking over anyone to say I could share a screen that has full text about the different scenarios. It's a, it's a lot of language. Is that, is that a help to people right now in this room, Jillian? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let's see if I'm able to do that. Um, okay, so Stephen, I can address um, this comment from Stephen. Whoop. Okay, all this development is for corporate owned housing, much better to focus on affordable ownership. Um, so that actually affordable ownership could be part of the, um, not only the scenarios, but a program or policy, um, creating more affordable ownership in the county. Let me try to drop these in the chat because I'm not going to be able to note take well. This is Let's do that. And then it'll actually be shared by all of the breakout groups. So that, that sounds good. And I like doing these where we can see everyone's faces. It, it provides a better, um, better environment for discussion. Thanks for your patience. Okay, those should be in the chat for folks now. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Nikki, do you have a comment on one of the sites or one of the, sorry, the scenarios? Uh, well, it's hard to do. I, I think um, the entire county uh, distribution is a good idea because there's different needs in different places. Some people are agricultural workers, et cetera. Others need to be near towns because that's where they work. So that part is good. But uh, looking at the others, the racial equity and historic patterns of segregation uh, infill and environmental hazards, all these are great. But I would like to kind of just deal with one section, and that is the section from Tam Junction down, because they are affected hugely by sea level rise and fire danger. And they are huge traffic routes and huge escape routes. So if something happens with fire, they gotta come down, and leave West Marin and get down, and there's very few ways of doing that. Um, that means they have to come out through Manzanita or they've got to go through Mir uh, Mill Valley. They have no choice. Same problem. You have sea level rise. We have had, and I've been taking pictures of Manzanita and Waldo Point Harbor where I live, and the whole flooding level that's going up, the sea level is rising. Definitely, obviously, since I moved here in 2004. Um, so Tam Junction, Manzanita, Marin City, Gate 6 Road, which leads traffic onto 101 North and gets hugely backed up if it's, uh, there's any problems on 101, is, is really a problem. So I'm not saying don't do it. I think infill is good, things of that sort. But I really question why uh, 150 Shoreline and Manzanita got accepted. I think it's the dumbest thing that ever happened. Honestly, if it had been built uphill somewhere else a little bit more, but those owners are going to be responsible for flooded cars as sea level rise goes. They should be, if not. Um, it's in Marin City. Um, the building should be 
can be made bigger, larger, et cetera, to include more ho housing in some cases, but they're really pretty well built out except for 825 Drake. And 825 Drake is an overkill. 825 Drake was actually discussed with Marin City folks that it should become a, uh, with, and also with the um, church that had it up for sale, that it would become a community land trust. And the county, county, city um, boss essentially ignored it and let that go. So I have a, a real problem. We can't do a whole lot more here in Gate 6 Road because we're gonna flood. We already do flood. <laughs> so, and then the rest of it becomes, uh, you know, well, the point at Harbor becomes, you know, it's the only part of us. And then Gate, um, you know, the other harbors are the only things that are part of this and they're going skyrocketing. So yeah, it's a problem. A serious problem down here. And I really thank, want to make thank that you clear. for yeah, thank you. That that was a great comment. Um any other I I, ha, I see some comments in the chat. Um so we're gonna take note of these. So why not give Marin City residents home ownership opportunities similar to what Nikki was saying? Um, why doom low income residents to be renters and then Susan and Christopher wrote in their comment. It's a little confusing calling the principal scenarios. All four seem important and should be balanced. Another factor that should be considered is developability for both nonprofit and for-profit developers. Very low income housing will actually be built. How will that be factored in? Um, you're fortunate to have a member of the, the housing staff on here. So I, I can answer that question just a little bit. So, um, the state has actually made it very difficult for cities, towns, unincorporated to put sites in their housing element um, that have well used existing uses um, that don't have significant infrastructure. There's there's um, a, a bill from the state um, that basically stipulates all of these details for site selection. So our, our state housing and community development agency has become much stricter about what sites could be allowed. I won't go into any more detail because then I'm just going to start answering questions. And I really want to hear that was a great comment about the principal scenario situation. So um, is there anyone else who who wants to comment on on the scenarios or? Sure, I will. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm Suzanne Sadowski, and I'm uh, an advocate of affordable housing in my community. I'm in West Marin. I'm incorporated West Marin. I think we, um, what I'm interested in is preserving the quality of life in our community. We've had, uh, when I first moved to the San Geronimo Valley, it was affordable, and that meant that people of all walks of life could be able to live here, including teachers, including artists, including writers, including musicians, people working for nonprofit organizations. And um, unfortunately, uh, it's been priced out. People have been priced out. Also, we have an aging population and the people who serve, the older people are, have no place to live that's commutable to our community. Um, and we have, uh, you know, people working in the schools, not just teachers, teachers, aides, custodial staff, all of whom need places to live. People who work for nonprofit organizations, as I did for a long time, don't make enough money to move here now. And yet we require the services of those people. So for me, the quality of the life for our communities is as important as everything else that we've been talking about. And certainly everything else that we've been talking about is extremely important. Uh, in the Valley, we have all of the constraints that people in the San Geronimo Valley that exist in terms of traffic, in terms of fire hazards. Um, we also have um, an issue having to do with waste management. And there have been a number of discussions that have gone on over the years of putting in various kinds of waste management systems so that the failing systems that are near the creeks uh, are sustainable. Um, and, you know, so maybe instead of a big 
uh, waste treatment facility that people are not particularly fond of. Maybe we can talk about smaller clusters of waste treatment facilities as we do exist in certain areas. So I think I want to thank Julian and the staff and, you know, the, the contract, everyone who's put this together, because I think it's a very robust and very essential discussion that we have. And I just want to thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, have any of the scenarios spoken to you related to kind of the constraints that, that you discussed? Um, any of the scenario, uh, could you tell, ask me again? What sure, so it's, so there, you know, the four scenarios that yeah. the ensure countywide distribution scenario well, exactly, yeah, definitely mm -hmm. countywide distribution is important. But I think for me, the two most important is racial equity, uh, which we suffer from in the Valley. We've had a legacy of a restricted covenants in housing, which have contributed to it. And now the cost of housing exacerbates the fact that we have a very small distribution of people of color in our community that needs to be addressed. Um, and also the environmental issues are very, very important for all of us here in the Valley. We wanna preserve the environment, wanna care for the environment. We also need fire safety, which is one of the reasons I'm interested in seeing whether the fire station moves to where the golf course used to be. Okay, uh, the great comments. I am going to call on some of the people that we haven't heard from. And if you're not ready to speak, then you can always just say next. Um, or pass, or type it in if, there, if you don't have the ability to speak through your computer. Um, Amy, do you, do you want to comment on any of the scenarios? Sure, I really, uh, Suzanne really resonated her, her, her comments with me, and I, I feel like the, um, the race, the equity, uh, to me, all, obviously all four of the scenarios, we all, I think, can agree are all very important, but I think the idea is that you choose the one that is the most I think we're putting it in, I feel, in a hierarchy. And um, to me, they're, they're obvious, you know, things are not going to get built where there's no water and there's a fire danger. And there, I mean, it, it, that's the housing's not going to be put there ultimately because the fire department will not allow it, the water department won't allow it. So, where did we start the things that where we're starting from is the, the equity issue, I think, is the biggest one where we can have a input on that and then wherever the housing is put the other things will be put into you know sea level rise the woman in in um southern marin you know i totally hear that too so i feel that if we all recognize that marin is you know i live in san Anselmo, it was voted the number one white whitest town in the United States or something like that. That's not a, you know, a good thing for anybody. So we do want our teachers, we want everybody to have housing. So I feel like that to me would be the, the most important scenario to start with. And then I think everything else is going to be, you know, I feel that the building will not happen on, they're not going to build houses where the sea level is going to rise and on in, in the wooey uh, hi fire. I'm a I'm the firewise person for my neighborhood. I'm very cognizant of. I'm very involved in that. They're not going to let development happen where it's unsafe. So, thanks, Amy. Yeah, you bring up a good point, which I I should have addressed with Susan and Christopher's comment, which is that we're taking all the guiding principles into account for all of the scenarios, but it's really which one speaks to you. And if all of them speak to you, then um, Jose is going to talk more about how to give give feedback ab about that. Um, so, okay, let's see. Is there um, Michael? Are you are you ready to comment, or do you do you want me to pass? Hi, uh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Hi. Um, listening to all that, all of those things are very important. I don't know why one would be more, they're all equally important when you're making a decision on, about this. 
I guess my overall question is, none of us are really urban planners. That's what you guys do. And so I'm just listening to all this and all of these, seeing the map with the little dots all over the place as potential things is, I feel like we're just checking a box to get public input. And now you can say you've gotten public input and then you guys are gonna do what you're gonna do and figure out which spaces work and that's what it's gonna be. Tell me I'm wrong. Okay. Um, thanks, Michael. I, I will, I mean, I, we're not really meant to address these comments, but I do wanna address your comments. Um, so we've, you know, we've done kind of a zoning exercise to figure out which of these sites is developable based on state law, based on things like fire hazards, you know, all environmental hazards, basically all the guiding principles. And we've come up with more sites than we need for the arena. So we do actually want your input because we're not coming to you and saying, here's the blueprint, what do you think about it? We're coming to you and saying, here are multiple range of sites. There's a lot of different ways that we can accomplish this what makes the most sense for you. And we're actually going to bring your feedback um, and Jose is going to go into, there's a couple of different ways that you can provide feedback online. And like a, you know, like a community survey, we're going to go bring that feedback to the board of supervisors. Ultimately it's the board of supervisors that decide it's actually not the planners. So that's why we are looking for your feedback so that we can go back to the board of supervisors and say, based on the feedback that we heard in the community workshop and also these different online resources we've found, X, Y, Z. Um, so thank you for your comment, Michael. Um, Bob, do you, do you have any comments on the scenarios? Are you available to comment? Um, Aline, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, would you like to comment? Um, yeah, I just put something in the, uh, chat box and my, I'm focusing on environment, especially out in West Marin. Uh, we moved here for environment and the water shortage, the fire hazard, if those could be emphasized. Okay, great, thank you so much. Okay, um, any, any other feedback from, from those we've already heard from or Bob, um, Steven, is there any scenario that's um, speaking to you? Yeah, uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, my video is not working tonight, but- um, That's okay. Uh, you know, I was involved in the 2000, I think 2012 housing element. Um, and, you know, we picked the sites. I, it's really hard to say from that brief glance of the, the uh, sites. It looks like a lot of the same sites are now being named uh, for development in uh, my community, which is uh, Marinwood Lucas Valley. And a lot of those sites are really, in my opinion, very impractical and will would uh, fundamentally change uh, the nature of our community. We are a single family uh, home neighborhood. We are mostly middle income people. And I believe that most of us who moved to Marin into leafy suburbs didn't do it for uh, the reason that they want to be located next to a large apartment complex. Um, having said that, I still, I do believe that we need to uh, create affordable housing for people, especially for lower income people. And um, as my, you did mention my comment before, I think the best way to do, do that and to provide equity is to provide uh, home ownership opportunities for lower income people, you know, just giving them, a, a, you know, moving them to a, a, a nonprofit, uh, low income 
uh, housing apartment is really not going to advance their their financial stake in the community. And I, I'm concerned that the emphasis is on corporate uh, corporate ownership of our communities. Um, and uh, Lily touched on on one of the 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 traps of this this housing element, which is different from 2012. That if these, uh, as I understand it, if these buildings don't get built, then automatically the builders will have a buy right um, uh, uh, privileges to develop as they wish. This really bothers me. There, the other thing about this uh, process that I object to is we are presented with a very limited menu of choices and asked to choose between them. Um, however, in my community, um, Marinwood, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with it, you know, we're right next to Silvera Ranch and St. Vincent's, both of which have uh, the desire to develop their properties, but the Board of Supervisors actually downzoned uh, the housing potential of that area. At one point, there was a, a for-profit development that uh, wanted to develop that property and put up to 6,000 homes there. Now, that still is going to be a challenge for our community, especially if these are all non-profit um, housing uh, developments, because we, we would have to build infrastructure there. But it's doable. It's next to the freeway. It's vacant, and so it would not disrupt uh, long-established neighborhoods. And, you know, basically you could build it environmentally sensitive. You could build really a great community there. And um, so when, the, when you say you're, you're, you're picking these sites, you're really just picking them. You've already pre-selected the criteria for uh, what sh what can be built under our existing um, uh, building or, or development envelope. We really should think in terms of expanding um, our buildable land in uh, certainly in, in West or uh, East Marin. And um, I, I just, there's so much that is wrong with this process because it penalizes the county for the actions of private developers. And not only that, it's going to severely impact uh, our communities uh, with a lot of what I would consider overdevelopment. And um, I, I just think there needs to be a reboot of the process. I had made the comment uh, in the chat that I actually think that Marin County should be joining other um, uh, cities and counties throughout the state that plan to fight this uh, unjust law. Uh, one other thing that we can consider um, is that Marin County has not seen the population growth uh, that was expected and projected, and we now have an unbelievable uh, projection of housing needs while uh, much of our, our, you know, a lot of people are moving out of California because of the high cost of living here. Um, so I guess if I can kind of summarize it, I think the goals are worthy goals. Um, however, I think the solutions uh, presented tonight and presented and, and working through the H, uh, the uh, RENA requirements are not realistic uh, for Marin County. What would be realistic is expanding um, uh, our developable, developable lands and also to um, create opportunities for, you know, the lower, mid, uh, middle income people to ha have home ownership. You know, why are we giving our, our, our community over to corporate development? I, I don't really quite understand. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I am 
really excited for you to hear the rest of the presentation because um, the the online tool that we have is something that I, I'm really interested to, to hear your feedback on the results of that. So um, that's all the time we have. Thank you. Okay, well, recording back. in progress. Welcome back. So we hope that you had good discussion in your groups um, and uh, that there were a lot of different opinions and, and different information shared about people's preferences and, and interests as it relates to housing. Um, we find these conversations to be incredibly important. Um, there's, there's a question in the chat I think I can clear up right now. It says, a lot of you have MIG after your name. Um, and uh, that is the name of the consulting firm that is assisting um, the, the county. It's more Isofano and Goldsman, and we say MIG. So uh, that's our abbreviation. So um, we appreciate everyone's uh, participation. Our note takers were very busy. And so all of the notes are going to be summarized um, so that we can share what we heard verbally from you all about the site selection process. And now I am going to bring back Jose Rodriguez. And he is going to talk about balancing act and get more into the details and, and the specifics of the Great, sites. Thanks, Joan. Jose? Right, I wanna talk about balancing act. So what, what is balancing act? Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, balancing act is gonna be a tool uh, that the public can use to help with the site selection process and provide comments on specific sites as well as the scenarios that we talked about earlier. Uh, the site is almost ready. It should be live tomorrow. I, we don't have a, uh, the county, I'll let county staff answer uh, at the end of my presentation when exactly it'll be live, but it's very, very soon. Uh, but I'm going to do a demo because we have it ready. To get to the Balancing Act, you do need to go to uh, the county website, actually where you registered for this uh, workshop. If you go right below that, you'll see four little icons, and one of them is the Balancing Act icon. Uh, next slide. And I'm just going to, the next slide just zooms in. So that's the balancing act. So this will be live tomorrow. And I am going to share my screen, Joan, so I can kind of demo the software and how it works. And give me one moment here. All right. So when the site becomes live, uh, at this point, the county's just adding the links uh, to get to the site to balancing act. And so what this tool allows, as I mentioned, is again, to zoom in on sites uh, that we've identified, the process that I talked about earlier about uh, selecting the, or identifying the, the various candid candidate sites. Uh, and then you get to go in and comment and actually adjust some of the housing numbers on particular sites. Uh, when you do select that link on the county's website, you'll actually have the option to start on one of those four scenarios, the uh, countywide distribution, the uh, uh, considering the environmental hazards, uh, infill and equity. There is a balancing act for each one. Uh, so when we first go into it, the startup screen will, uh, will begin. And so you can take a look, you can read it. It talks about those four scenarios and what's included in the balancing act. I'm gonna go straight to, the, to, uh, to it. So this first one I have is the hazard scenario uh, that we talked about. And so here you can see the map. You can see there are their sites uh, that have been, that are identified and you can zoom in and take a look at the sites. I do wanna point out that when you start with the Bouncing Act, you are starting with a housing plan and this plan is tailored towards the hazard scenario. So if you select the infill, scenario, that scenario will be tailored to the infill. All the sites are there, um, but we started to adjust the number. So if there's a site in the hazard selection, I'll kind of show you an example momentarily. Some sites you'll see will have zero housing units because there's sea level rise or so there are other hazards that are affecting the housing units. But as 
planner or as uh, residents and you get to play a little bit of planners, uh, you get to adjust some of those numbers. So let me show you how. Let's zoom into site E here. Uh, you can see it's on Lucas Valley Road. This is the juvenile uh, Marin County Juvenile Hall. Uh, if you select on that site, you'll immediately go down uh, to that to that particular site. It has the address, and you can start adjusting the sites, uh, the number of units. Uh, right now, we put it at 237. If you feel like that's too high, you can hit the negative, and you can start decreasing the number of units on that particular site. However, if you notice, the bar has turned red. So you're now kind of short in meeting your, the arena number. So maybe you can make that up on another site. You can go back up and adjust, find another site. And you can add additional units. And now you have a housing plan. The goal, what we want is for you to comment on these sites. Now, I will point out, we don't have all of the sites on here. We have some of the top, top sites that we know will provide a lot of housing units. Uh, and some of these will require zoning changes. I do wanna point out the county will provide a listing of all the housing sites. There will be another tool to take a look at those housing sites and comment on them. Uh, so that is coming soon. We're still, we're still cleaning, uh, getting that ready uh, for the public. But this is gonna be a, a, a tool that you'll be able to not only just adjust the housing units, but you'll also be able to provide comments on particular site. You can uh, provide a comment and, and submit, the, uh, submit those if I can spell right. Uh, it talks about a little bit of the scenarios. If you select on the I, it gives a little bit of background information on that particular scenario. Again, you can add a comment to the scenario. And another thing you can do is you can share your information. You can share it through email, Facebook, Reddit, uh, Twitter, and so forth. So some, you can have someone take a look and say, hey, look, this site's available. I made comments to this particular site. Uh, why don't you take a look at other sites and make comments too? So again, this site will be live tomorrow uh, and ready for uh, the public to comment on and take a look at uh, the sites. And you can, like I mentioned, you could go through the entire county. The challenge is that there's many sites throughout the county. Oh, I, there is one point I wanna make out. There is at least uh, 17 different sites that you can adjust the numbers and housing units on. Uh, there is a second component where we didn't put all the numbers in, but you can provide comments on particular uh, other sites as well. These are probably be a little bit smaller sites. Maybe some of these don't need the zoning changes, uh, but you can provide specific comments saying, I don't like this site. I like this site. Maybe this site could uh, provide more housing. Um, we want to hear comments on these and take a look at the different scenarios, provide the comments on the scenarios. And if you can share this with your friends and neighbors uh, and let them know about this website. Just last thing before I go, this is the, the county's housing element website page. This is where you registered. This is where the balancing act uh, link will be. Uh, there is a site selection, oops, I think I may have selected the wrong one. There is a site selection website where you can also go ahead and suggest sites. Uh, the public has already begun to put sites in as well. So there are uh, multiple options, again, to provide comments on sites that you want to suggest and some of the existing sites that the county has identified through that process I talked about earlier. Joan? Okay, so um, this is this is the tool that we will be using. Um, um, you know, there's there's a lot of trade-offs. There's a lot of give and take in terms of figuring out what is the kind of the the composition of sites and and densities at those sites that is going to help the county meet its RENA number. Um, and I think, as the team said, we're we're starting from more possibilities. So you are narrowing it down. And the sites that um, Jose is showing you are the sites that, um, you know, you, you can really influence and change um, in terms of densities and dialing things up and dialing things down. Um, so we do, we do want to take your questions. We have the remaining time. Um, we can have um, we can have Jose, you know, take,
go through another demonstration or we can take some specific um, comments or questions. So um, there's a, a comment um, that it looks like one of the sites is within the Sausalito city limits. Um, and they said, just a reminder, it needs to be unincorporated. So let's make sure we double check that site, but the balancing act will only have unincorporated county sites in it. Um, Joan, I think that Jennifer is suggesting that, so we have a site where people can suggest housing sites mm -hmm. um, that's different from balancing act. And it sounds like someone suggested a site within city limits. So I, I think, you know, she's just reminding everyone that the, the planning for this housing element is for unincorporated merit. Mm -hmm. And as you said, for Balancing Act, we are only discussing unincorporated merit. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jillian, thanks for, thanks for clarifying that. Sure. Um, we have a question, what does it mean if a site has zero housing units? So if you zero something out, what happens to it, Jose? Uh, so if you zero something out, that's letting the county, county know that, hey, maybe this is a site that we either don't want housing units on, uh, or, or you're not interested in, a, in housing there. Now, if it does come preloaded at zero, that means through the scenario process that I talked about, maybe it's a site that does fall uh, within potentially a sea level rise area. Uh, we do have a couple sites that are there. And so in the hazard scenario, we put those at zero uh, because in that scenario, uh, if, moving forward as we whittle down uh, that's something we want to provide that information to the Board of Supervisors. Okay, thanks Jose. Um, let's see, so there's there's a, a, a question here. Um, can jurisdictions within Moran County trade allocations? So does the housing element process allow that? I'll take that. Um, sorry, Jillian, I don't know if you were going to. So there, there is a process that's called that allows um, cities and counties to form their own um, subregion. It's called a, a subregion, and then the way that works is they get the a whole, they get the allocation that they are assigned from, um, you know, through the, the RENA process, the regional housing need allocation process, and then they get to decide together where the right places are for housing. So instead of saying like San Rafael, you get this many, Novato County, you get this many, they, we could, if, if we f had formed a subregion, then we could decide together where the best place for housing was. And one community might take more housing, and another might take less and somebody might have more funding available or whatever, there's a, there's a trade-off that is, happens on the local level. Um, our jurisdictions have not formed a subregion. Um, there are examples of it around the, around the Bay Area. Napa has done it, um, San Mateo. So there, there are examples of it. Um, so in that case, they can kind of, but you, at this point, we can't just kind of trade. You have to enter that process a, a few years ago, but that's something that in the future, the, the county and the cities could consider doing. Okay, thanks, Lily. Um, so there's a question, will developers get to skip over serious environmental health concerns to develop housing? Do you want me to take I can that? Answer. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, so as part of the housing element, we have an environmental review process. It's a very robust environmental review process um, so that, you know, the serious environmental health concerns um, will, there, those sites will, um, you know, the environmental, sorry, um, the environmental review process um, will bring to light if there's any serious environmental health concerns. And um, if there's an environmental health concern on a site, then it will probably not be considered uh, to develop housing. And I think Lili can, can speak to that. Right, so the only time that you would be able to add housing on a site that has serious environmental concerns is if it was mitigated. So, you know, if, if the project was able to address those concerns, then you could develop housing on it. Okay, thanks, Lily. 
Um, Jose, I think this one might be for you. Um, do current projects or those approved show up as, no, as uh, numbers in the map? Are they on the map like the pipeline projects? No, those will not be shown. Those applications obviously have been submitted to the county uh, and the, the, you know, depending on the app, the approval process, but for the balancing act and this technically, uh, th there will not be included in the site uh, in the balancing act and they're technically not as part of the sites inventory, because these are sites that there's no applications for we don't know what, are, you know, the different affordabilities are lit yet, because uh, there's no applications for any of these yet. The, the goal for the housing element is to allow the um, the county to provide housing and make sure they have the land use and zoning in place. So, uh, no. So the the going back to the, the question, the credit sites and the pipeline sites will not are not on the balancing act. Okay, thank you. Um, so, who is it? Who decides? Do developers decide if the housing will be low low income, moderate income housing? Um, and this person is uh, concerned about teachers and county workers uh, needing housing. I can start the answer and um, Lily, if, if you want to um, fill in. So for the housing element, uh, we have to assign affordability to all of the sites that we include in the housing element. So that would include how many units are low income, moderate income, above moderate income. Um, and, and we assign units to, to those sites. Um, So that will include workforce housing that are part of the housing element. And we will have a community meeting to talk about those programs and policies, but ideas like um, home ownership um, for, for people in the county or um, more workforce housing and, and kind of specific housing programs that don't relate to assigning, you know, low, moderate, above moderate to specific sites can be addressed through our programs and policies. And ultimately, HCD um, has been much clearer to us that these policies um, need, to, need to be clear um, and they need to have clear goals that we can achieve within the next eight years. Okay, thanks, Jillian. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be able to answer this tonight. It's about a specific property. Um, the person's asking why Marinwood Plaza was included, and they have concerns about the cleanup activities um, at that site not having been completed. So we will, we, you know, we'll take these comments into consideration, and I encourage you to um, use Balancing Act to, to also write these comments and to use Balancing Act to think creatively about, okay, if, if this is a site that you don't feel housing should be developed on, then where should those planned units go based on the scenario that you choose? Okay, thanks, Jillian. Um, there's a, a question, if there's a site, if there's a site within a city, who would you contact to suggest it? Um, okay, so I'm gonna put a link in the chat. We have a countywide housing elements website where you can find contact information for each of the cities and towns. Okay, thanks Jillian. Um, so Jose, if you could tell us about the, the housing sites map, does it total up to the 300, the 3,600 units needed or is it more than that? What does it cover? Right, right now each of those scenarios does when you, when you first go into the site, you saw that, hey, you meet the housing plan, that green bar was there. So right now the site is set up for the sites that we've identified, they do add up to the number of housing units we need for the arena. Uh, so that's kind of our, your starting point. Uh, if you like that scenario and, and you like how the numbers of housing are identified, then you could submit that housing plan as is but we're looking for feedback. If you want to make specific adjustments and reduce number of housing units on particular sites, you'll see, you'll get out of it. You won't meet that RIA. Uh, so the goal of the, the website is to, again, have you comment on specific sites and adjust that number and to take a look to see if it does meet the RENA or not. Um, so that's how we set up uh, the Balancing Act website. Okay, thank you. 
Um, there's a comment here. It's difficult to assign the number of units without taking affordability into account. So can you, can you explain how someone might approach that in their comments? Oh, oh sorry, I can, I can try that. So I, I think that, you know, there, what we're trying to plan for is housing at all income levels. And really the kind of who's going to live there is less what this exercise is about. It's, it's about, can we accommodate all the housing? There's also opportunities where you can provide comments that you are supporting affordable housing, if that's what you want, or that you think this is a, a better place for market rate housing. But, but really this is about where we can, can provide additional housing in our, in our communities at all income levels. Um, and then we'll be evaluating based on kind of the really, the really strict guidelines that the state has about whether that site can be counted towards a lower income. There's really more specificity if it's going to be, be counted in that lower income category. So, you know, we also need to apply those, those constraints that, that, that the state puts on. And I don't know, Jose, if you want to add anything. No, I, no, I think you... You, uh, you covered it, yeah. Okay, so here, here's a question. I'm gonna um, stay close to verbatim. So the person wants to validate if they have this correct. So the purpose of this effort is to arrive at a plan that accounts for the needed number of housing units. Um, and in a given time period, or no developers step forward to build the units and projects get mired in lawsuits. In the end, very little housing is actually built and assigned. Um, can you comment on how the housing element um, responds to these concerns? Uh, Jillian, I'll take this if you want. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the housing element, you know, what we're talking about tonight is really the sites and where we could accommodate additional housing in our communities. But there's other parts of the housing element that include programs and policies. So in addition to, to identifying specific sites where we could develop housing, we also need to evaluate what constraints there are to housing development. And then we need to have programs and policies that address those, those constraints. Um, but ultimately, that's our job is to really set the table to say, here it is, if, if somebody wants to develop it, but we are, the county is not, is not ultimately responsible for building housing. We are not developers and, and don't have that expertise, but, but we are required to, in addition to the, the sites to have programs and policies to, to address constraints and help facilitate housing, especially housing that's affordable to lower income households. Okay, so um, has the county surveyed large landowners to see if they're interested in developing their property? Their, this would increase the options under discussion? Haley, do you want to take this one? Sure. At, at this point, the, the, first, um, the, the first kind of step that has been done to identify sites is really doing this GIS zoning analysis to say this is where housing could develop. Then once we put that site, that whole list out, then we're asking for feedback, including feedback from community members and property owners. And so that would be, that's really a next step um, in looking at, at the sites and the feasibility of the sites that we have, have identified through the, the zoning exercise um, that, that really had the intent of identifying housing throughout our communities. Um, and Jose, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. No, no. Um, actually, I, I do want to uh, respond to one, one of the comments about the R sites. Um, and a lot of those are listed as zero. Uh, you know, one of the challenges with the tool is that it was difficult to put all of the sites uh, on the balancing act. And uh, there's the top sites where you can adjust the numbers, but there are another series of sites where you can just adjust, uh, we're just looking for uh, text feedback. Uh, we're not looking for number feedback. Uh, so I just want to make sure I um, address that comment. Thanks. Okay. 
Um, there's a quick question. Somebody's asking what VTA is, and VTA is Veronica Tam and Associates, and they are a teaming partner with MIG that is uh, that is uh, supporting the uh, technical analysis and helping to deliver the housing element. Um, let's see. So there's a question: Is this taking into account ADUs? So I'm not. I'm going to let uh, Jose answer this one. Yeah. Uh, the, bal the balancing act numbers are not taking into the ADUs, but we will be, uh, when we do get, when we whittle down our numbers, what, what we see happening is that there's going to be a lot of comments on sites. And we we're hoping the feedback that we get from the community is that we whittle down the sites. What are the sites that the community wants to see get developed? We're going to take advantage of counting the ADUs, the state is really strict on how jurisdictions can count ADUs in the housing element. We will definitely be putting ADUs in the housing element, counting them. We have to use past projections uh, and uh, within the past few years. And, and those, those are the numbers we'll use in the housing element, but they're not in the balancing act. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any requirements for senior housing? Uh, we've talked about ADUs, but um, just there's a question about that. So I, I can speak to this. We we don't have any, um, you know, the sites are going to be designated as low, moderate, above moderate. Um, it, it's not going to stipulate seniors or workforce. So um, one of the ways that we can address senior housing um, specifically is by um, creating programs and policies around senior housing. So I encourage you to uh, write to us about any recommendations you have related to senior housing um, and, and also to join our workshop. Uh, so okay. I, I would just say that senior housing is one of the special needs populations that the housing element needs to consider. Those include, you know, um, individuals with disabilities, seniors, families with children, farm workers. So there's a variety of kind of special needs populations that we also need to uh, evaluate those needs and, and consider solutions in the housing. Okay, well, I'm just keeping an eye on the time here and I want to make sure that we wrap up. Um, so we, we do have some next steps. Um, and again, we want to refer you to the county website. Um, we're going, the county's going to be continuing the conversation. So we, we call it our roadshow. We are doing things virtually because of COVID. Um, but there's, you know, just eight opportunities out in the community where we'll be taking an abbreviated version of this presentation, mainly because we, we have an hour or less, and um, going out into the communities um, at these specific locations. Um, we'll give an update on the housing element, the site selection process. We'll be introducing balancing act, and as time permits, we'll be um, receiving comments. Um, so these are you, um, all of this information is on the website. You are welcome to participate in as many outreach activities as you like. Um, and we are going to be relying on balancing act. And I know um, there's, you know, probably still a number of questions. And I know um, some folks, it's always good to know that if you're not sure uh, how something works, that um, there'll be staff virtual office hours. So two of the dates are right after the roadshow meeting that is scheduled, but there's information on the website. You'll be able to log on and join county staff and they can do a quick tutorial with Balancing Act. They can answer your questions. Um, we wanna make sure that you have the opportunity to participate. Um, because your feedback is really important to help us get to the numbers of, for the different housing categories that we need. Um, so we really appreciate everyone's participation tonight. And before we go, I wanna turn it back to Lily Thomas for some final words. Lily? Thank you. Thanks, Joan. And thank you everybody for coming tonight, for engaging with us, for your participation and for your commitment to your community. Um, we, we are very appreciative um, of your um, involvement and your feedback. 
I hope the workshop was useful and provided you with a good overview of kind of our approach to sites that are being considered for more housing in our community. And your input is valued and important. And this is just the beginning of the conversation. As outlined, there are more opportunities to be involved and to provide your feedback and insights. And that's really going to help us um, structure a recommendation that we make to, to the Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission. We look forward to hearing from you, from each of you in the future. Um, thank you and good night. Okay, thank you. We are officially adjourned. We appreciate your participation. Good night.